Ashley come in when every when she's available? Can everyone see this PowerPoint presentation that's on the screen? Gina, I'm just gonna start the recording. Yes, um, Jeffrey, are you ready? Okay. Check one. Can you hear me? You're good to go. It is a, always a good time to change people's lives. I always have to start it like that, Jeffrey. Welcome, Vermont, Vermont, to another episode of the, of the Cannabis Control Board of Social Life and Civil. Um, we'll start. So today's uh, October the 25th, 2021. We'll start by taking attendance uh, from, the, from the subcommittee. Uh, Ara Hashim. Present. Ashley Reynolds. Present. I'm oh, sorry, uh, Julio Thompson. Here. Good afternoon. It's Susanna Davis. Okay, and then uh, in the in the for the NACB, Gina Cranley Cole. Present. O'Donnell. Present. I'm Jeffrey Gallegos. Um, and then for the room, uh, can you tell us who's there? Yep, it's just me from the board, Julie Holbert, and one member of the public. All right, welcome. So for going on to the next uh, topic, uh, we have received, unfortunately, no public comments. For this, for this installment, so for anybody in the Vermont citizenry who's, who's following along, please feel free to offer your perspectives and thoughts at this link that's posted here on the slide. Um, and then we will also move to, we need to uh, approve the minutes for the last meeting, so may I please have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. All right, thank you. Any second? I'll second. Excellent. Okay, the previous meeting's minutes have been approved, and with that, I will turn it over to Gina. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. So we are getting into the last portion of our social equity program, and then we are moving on to diversity, equity, and inclusion program later on today. Uh, hoping to wrap this up by the end of the week. Um, and do our start of our finishing our phase one and then on to phase two, which is where we come to a town near you um, and get public comments and how social equity candidates would like to see these programs run and we'll be able to hear your story and be part of the co-design of this. And then phase three, everything goes to the Vermont Cannabis Control Board to finalize um, what they deem would be the best for the social equity programs. So I, it was a little hard to find some information about who should be a disproportionately impacted community. I know a lot of the basis that we made was based on who a social equity candidate is. So you know, high mass high areas and large areas of incarceration due to the war on drugs. Some of the information that I found is sort of like, health rankings and um, you know traffic stops so here's some information about traffic stops now these are the number of traffic stops so you know in towns that are going to have more people in it of course those numbers will sort of be increased this was for 2020 so i'm not really sure if that's really a good example of information or data that we want to use and then we also had from 2019, sort of the county health rankings. Um, so, you know, the green box is indicating the health outcomes and the blue box are some different health factors. Now the lower numbers indicate better performances. So, you know, Bennington has a 12 and, you know, health outcomes and health factors, which would kind of put it on a really high level of you know health risk and people not necessarily you know having more health issues in those counties where Edison is you know two and two so they're doing pretty well. This is just some information of some data that I was able to pull off. I know we have also sent this around um, 
to some different department in Vermont to try to get these issues. But I know we've spoken about this last week, and it really sounded like from everyone's perspective on the subcommittee that these certainly were counties to include in disproportionately impacted communities. So I'm going to start with Nada. What are, what are your thoughts about this? So, I mean, broadly speaking, um, my thoughts remain the same. I, I think I brought it up last time, you know, when I look at this list and, you know, when I was thinking of towns that might have been disproportionately impacted, you know, my first thought was the war on drugs and communities that would be over-policed. Um, and, you know, the first community that came to mind was Rutland, followed by Bennington, um, I know Brattleboro is up there as well, and uh, and then you have Burlington, which has the, the highest concentration of BIPOC people in Vermont. Uh, so, so yeah, when, when I was thinking of disproportionately impacted, my mind was focused on the war on drugs. Um, I know there are other factors that we're going to talk about, such as health and uh, economic factors as well. What was that last county that you mentioned? Uh, I think it was Burlington, I mentioned, that has the highest concentration of uh, BIPOC people. Okay. Which, all of those counties we have are here. Are there any counties that we have here that you might want us to take off, or any that you would like us to add? Uh, nothing is coming to mind at the moment. I, I think it looks good. I don't know a lot about Burlington County, uh, but... Uh, yeah, I think it works fine the way it is. Thank you. Julio, what are your thoughts? Yeah, there's no, no one there I would take off. Thank you. Any, any ones that you think we should add, or do you think this is a consist, this list consists of, of the major ones that we want to focus on? As far as I know, these would be the major ones. Thank you. And Ashley, your thoughts? Um, I agree that these are these are the ones that I would expect, and I think these are the ones that we should concentrate on. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the things that I did want to state was that these are these impacted communities are, are the ones that we always concentrate on. Um, that they do not change annually because these are the ones that were impacted on the war on drugs, and these are the ones who sustained the harm, and we don't want to constantly be changing that just because an area has more of a BIPOC community. We know they will shift and change, but this is about past harm, not, um, now if there is future harm, that should be addressed um, in, in another way, but we have seen in the last few years a subtle change, shift, and and the way that Vermont has been handling um, the war on drugs. Um, Nada, how do you feel about just capping this and saying that these we're not shifting or changing anything annually about these communities? That these are communities where the harm was done, and um, we're not fluctuating and changing anything every year. Um, I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. Um, I mean, if we're talking about decades of police work and you know the, the, how long the war on drugs has lasted, then I, I can see how that makes sense. Um, I mean, there are always there, there's always new data and information coming out about different areas that might be over policed. You know, for example, I think it was just last year that the report came out that Brattleboro. Um, at the highest number of uh, bias-related incidents in terms of uh, traffic stops. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure how I feel about making it set in concrete that this list will never change. So my thoughts on this is that this is past harm that has occurred, not future harm. I mean, and with, with the legislation that's put into control where this is now legalized, all of the harm occurred when it was not legalized. And that's what we're trying to focus on. 
which is why I'm trying to say that we don't revisit or change these counties every year, that these communities stay, uh, because that's where the harm was previously done before um, cannabis was legalized. Yeah, I, I, I do think that makes sense, I, but I do also think that there will be um, legislators who want to know what sort of metrics we use um, to pick these counties because I know, you know, everyone. It's, it seems like everyone generally agrees that these are the areas, um, but I think there will be people who want to know how we came about choosing these areas beyond just anecdotes that you know places like Rutland or Brattleboro were over police. No, very good. And you know, I definitely we work with Susanna's off Davis's office. I wish she was on the call now. Uh, you know, she also recommended you know very similar to this to us. Um, so, uh, Ashley, what are your thoughts? Um, I definitely hear um, where Nader's coming from, and I do think that from what I've seen in the existing industry out west and otherwise where things are legal uh, doesn't mean that criminal activity is just completely eradicated as a result of the legalization um, so I do really sympathize to, to Nader's point um, however you know I don't know what we have for being able to reevaluate this let's say every two years every three years every five years um, hopefully we see some of these, you know, counties are off the board, you know, but, you know, there could be some that are added as a result. Um, so I don't know that, I, I, I feel like maybe we are kind of overcomplicating this a little bit because we want to do, do the most good in the places where there's the most harm. Um, so I think for the, you know, the purpose of getting this program up off the ground, I think it's, it's focusing on past, past harm. Thank you, Ashley. And Julio? Um, I think that the, uh, the locations that are up on the screen are, um, I think, are consistent with kind of longer term issues um, in a criminal justice system, not just something that, you know, like it's an issue just one year. Um, I think there are, um, these are um, areas that also have, as you pointed out, other risks that are associated with them that are uh, reflected in health outcomes and, and so forth. So I don't, there's nothing here that you, that you have here that strikes me as like, um, you know, inappropriate or something that haven't had. Um, you know, long-term issues to, to deal with, particularly, when, you know, in the kind of the, the high tide of the war on drugs um, in Vermont and, and nationally. And are you okay with keeping this as fixed communities and not changing them every year? Because no, I, I, I think if you're talking about going forward, I think the question will be, um, you know, it sort of depends how forward we are because I mean, the, when we learn, when we're looking at outcomes that we want to see in these, you know, in these communities, we don't want these to be um, viewed in the same light as they were in the past. Um, and so I think that it's it's a good idea uh, going forward to have you know an eva you know evaluation or evaluation. But I think if you're, you know, if the time period that you're looking at is like the pre-legalization period or the pre, maybe decriminalization might be a better um, um, period to start looking at. I don't think their past is going to change, um, but I think their, you know, hopefully, you know, their their present and their future are going to change. So that was, I think that's sort of what I, what I heard uh, not are saying, and, and I would agree with that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so I don't mind um, if it wants to be revisited where in the future maybe counties come off. I just don't want to add any more on 
if there was not harm that we have found in between um, from these counties um, that may be determined by the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Well, uh, well if, I, if I could just follow up then, if you're talking about adding other communities, I mean, in the last meeting we had, we mentioned two communities that are on this screen. Uh, I uh, raised the question as to whether Barry City um, uh, might have uh, outcomes where there was have a you know disproportionate impact, uh, and I think Susanna raised um, Addison County where there is a um, it's known to have a large migrant farmer uh, or migrant farm worker community which might have its own challenges historically with law enforcement. So those two, um, uh, you know, were not are not have, have not been added to the list. So. What um, are those counties that you want us to look into? Would you like us to add those counties? Um, you know, I think that, yes, I think we had to look into them. I, mean, I think Susanna made a good point. I think when we are looking at negative interactions with law enforcement, um, you have to look at communities that that come up against that system for a variety of reasons and so that could be uh that could be poverty that could be uh a history or a reputation uh or um you know new vermonters who come in and uh you know over you know historically might have had um, you know, not, not as positive interactions with law enforcement uh, might not be uh, as welcoming in some communities, at least historically. I think recent history um, is different, but if you're looking at the longer term, uh, the longer backwards look, I think, than Addison and um, Addison County, I would, I would feel more comfortable, confident about because I, because I know um, more about that. Um, the migrant community there, um, and Barry would be something that I would just want folks to take a look at. It's not, um, it's not, nothing disparaging about Barry City, but it is just one that has had a lot of policing in the past, and and, um, and it might be that they they would fall within the criteria you want to you want to look at. Okay. Yeah. Um... We were not looking at low income as that was not one of the social equity um, criteria. Um, but Nader, what are your thoughts about Barry? I know um, Julio saying it was um, largely policed, and I know that you worked in that sector for quite a long time. What are your thoughts on that?
communities going forward because these are communities based on past harm, not on future harm. And um, so Suzanne, what are your thoughts on Barry and Adam? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with adding them. Um, and I think that if we're looking at the totality, first of all, sorry for being late, okay. Also, I think that um, I would be cool with adding these, particularly because if we're looking at the totality of uh, harm and being underrepresented and all of the various factors that make people be underrepresented in business and in other factors, then you're gonna see Barry popping up anyway. There's a lot of economic issues, there's a lot of health disparities, there's a lot of housing issues, and so, um, Barry is an interesting example of a place that has a, a, a confluence of factors that we care about in this program. And I don't know what the data show in terms of war on drugs specifically for Barry, but um, I, I certainly wouldn't be upset if we added it in. Addison, I also agree with adding it in. Um, I, I think that the community, the people of color living in that area are often sort of under the radar because um, there is an increased struggle with immigration issues there. And, um, and so I think that adding that lends visibility to it. Also, on the question of past harm versus future harm, I do think that it's, it should probably be a combination. I mean, I know that this program is designed to rectify historical injustice, and so I think that our focus on past harm is important, and yet the system continues to cause harm for people, and it tends to be the same groups. So as that advances, um, I think that I would like to see a program that stays nimble and that recognizes, hey, you know what? We're seeing a lot of inequity because of a couple of years past, and we're seeing more patterns that are showing that there's inequity, and we may want to reconsider. Or like one of these disproportionately impacted communities might come off the list because this may have changed. I don't know. I'm stop talking, but those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. I appreciate those thoughts. Um, and I agree. You know, maybe we have a community that's no longer disproportionately impacted. But if there's new harm that's occurring, I think you know we need to really focus on you know. It's especially now what the past harm has occurred before legalization. Um, so, you know, with the prohibition, you know, we're basically saying we kind of got it wrong that this drug should not have been um, barred and, and then that people were still trying to do, consume it for whatever purpose it was. Um, and if people are doing things illegally with the drug after it is legalized, that are, are different issues to the past injustice of it. But I, I do understand wanting to help as, as many people as possible. Um, Lindsay, I see yeah. that you added a comment and I would love your thoughts on you know disproportionately impacted communities. Now just to give you some background, is that we're trying to focus on um, communities that have been harmed uh, due to the war on cannabis. And we have determined a social equity candidate is uh, a BIPOC community member and or um, a, an area for, it's escaping me for a minute, and uh, someone who was incarcerated or arrested due to um, cannabis. So we're trying to look into areas where there were like high rates of incarceration due to cannabis and or um, large uh, population of, of BIPOC. Yeah, I can't specifically speak to either of those, but earlier in the conversation, um, I'm not sure who spoke, just a couple before Susanna, but talked a bit about like the reputation and, and sort of people treating a community different because, simply because of the reputation. And I think that Barry City um, definitely struggles with reputation of what's going on on the streets. And I think that um, I put a link in there because the police chief even sounded the alarm back in September saying, you know, there's a there's a large, um, how do you say it, um, a large 
a large batch of illegal drugs here. So again, I don't I don't know specific drugs that he was talking about. I guess I just more was reacting to having uh, grown up in central Vermont. I, I would agree that it's an area that we should at least look into. So I don't have much beyond that. Okay, great. So based on the recommendations in our discussion that we would include Barry and Addison to this chart. And obviously these are just recommendations for the Cannabis Control Board and they'll make their final um, deliberations of exactly which communities. Um, it seems like we should not make a determination if this is just past harm or future harm to communities and allow the Vermont Cannabis Control Board to determine if it is just going to uh, stipulate these communities had to have harm before um, the, the war on cannabis or after um, if there are still some activities within communities that are still being harmed by cannabis um, if we're going to look for future communities in a year or or revising the program, these communities every year. So Nana, at, with the addition of Addison and Barry, do you approve these as recommendations of disproportionately impacted communities to the Vermont Cannabis Control Board? Yes. Thank you. Julio? Yes. And Ashley? She just has to leave. Um, thank you. So um, please state for the record that the two members of the Social Equity Subcommittee who are still on the call have voted yes to those additions of disproportionately impacted communities and the current ones that we have on the screen. So is before we get off of the Social Equity Program, is there anything that um, anyone would like to add that we may not have discussed or would like to discuss that should be included in Social Equity? Now, over the past seven weeks, we have discussed lots and lots and lots of stuff about it, and I will send you over a report um, later this week for you just to sort of have a summary of all of the recommendations that we've made in case there is something before our last meeting that you guys would want to add. But is there anything that you would like to add or discuss right now before we move on to diversity, equity, and inclusion programs? No? No? Okay, well, please think about it in the next few days so that we can have our final recommendations uh, forward to, to the Cannabis Control Board. But celebrate, we are done with social equity programs for the moment. That was an intense, like, seven and a half weeks right now. So congratulations, and I think you've made some incredible recommendations and certainly will help to shape the lives of other people. Um, so now let's move on to some other ones. We're gonna talk about our diversity, equity, and inclusion program. You know, as we've stated, um, the social equity program was about people who sustained harm due to um, the prohibition of cannabis. And the diversity, equity, inclusion is about making sure that historically underrepresented groups in society are included in the new industries that Vermont creates. So that is what the purpose of this program is, to encourage um, historically underrepresented groups and, all, and also to ensure a diverse and inclusive cannabis industry, which is really so, so very important. Uh, so we get on to our next questions. What groups should be included? You know, what are some groups that have been underrepresented? Now, we've spoken about women, you know, people with disabilities. I know um, LGBTQ. Julio, um, what, are your, what are your thoughts about um, some groups that should be included in this program? 
Uh, for me, uh, you know, the place that I would look at would be um, Vermont's laws that offer protections for uh, groups that have been either historically persecuted or, or marginalized. So um, statutes like the Vermont Public Accommodations or Fair Housing Act, um, Vermont's uh, Fair Employment Practices Act, or it's the hate crimes laws, um, because I think um, when you're looking at people who have a legacy of, uh, to put it mildly, challenges um, with uh, pursuing their rights in the state, um, uh, you're, you're also talking about immigrant communities. Um, you're talking about uh, people who, for whom you know, English is not their, their first or primary language. Uh, you're talking about uh, religious groups, um, and uh, you know you're you're talking about people of color. Um, so, um, and when you look at political representation and participation um, in government, you're you're talking about those same groups again. It's not just a phenomenon in one part of our life. It seems to all of our all the parts of our life in Vermont. So so what are what are some groups that you're you're thinking about? Uh, I think I just mentioned them but I'll mention them again. So people who are immig part of the immigrant immigrant. who have faced discrimination on the basis of their race, color, or religion, um, I think are uh, people who, you know, who if they, if they have that story to tell, that should be part of the, you know, the eligibility. Thank you, uh, Julia. Sure. Uh, Nada, what are, what are your thoughts? I'm in, I, I, I share the same opinion as Julio. My, my first thought of uh, group to add to this would be immigrants and refugees. So I, I would be in support of adding that group. What are your thoughts about the groups that are here? Women, people with disability, LGBTQ? I'm, I'm satisfied with the way the list looks right now. Um, I'm trying to think of any other groups that they want to include. Um, right now, the only ones that are coming to mind are immigrants and refugees. Uh, if anything else pops up, though, I'll make sure to add it. Thank you. Susanna? I'm comfortable with that list also. Um, and I agree with Julio about looking at what are the different categories overall. Those. Lindsay, your thoughts? I'm good with what's there. I'm not sure I can think of anything that's missing. Okay, thanks. So, Julio, I just want to make sure that I got the additions that you would like to see on the list as immigrants. We got uh, refugees more specifically from Nader. Um, and then anyone who has faced discrimination based on race, color, or religion. Um, I think that um, many of these people, well, on um, a color at least will be in the social equity program. So um, maybe we just indicated as um, religion or are there some other discriminations that you would like to include? Yeah, I just want to point out, and this may be something that, um, at least for um, folks who aren't from Vermont, Vermont's laws uh, specifically prohibit um, discrimination on the basis of color. Um, and it's not just race. Um, yeah. So um, that that's why. And, and, and so it could be that if you're looking at social equity aspect of it, 
and you are including race, then you should have color associated with that because that's specifically protected in all of the laws that I mentioned before. Um, but if, if, if that is already, if race and color is handled in the other category, then I would just say uh, discriminate on the basis of religion. Um, uh, you know, from our, at least the information we receive in terms of bias incidents or hate crimes or discrimination that occurs in the state, you know, after you get, um, the, usually the largest group is uh, uh, folks who are, are being mistreated on the basis of their race or color. Um, right after that is religion and national origin. So I think, uh, and immigrants are more than just refugees, as immigrants would include refugees, certainly, but it's not limited to them. Um, and I, I think that would probably also ca capture the subset I mentioned, which are people who are not, you know, for whom English is not their primary language, but that's likely to be caught, uh, caught up in immig immigrants as well. So English is not their primary language. So I, I have the on three additional bullet points to women, people with disabilities, LGBTQ, as immigrants or English or people whose, whose English is not their primary language. So I would say maybe English is their second language. Um, um, my only concern is with people who may have lived in Vermont their entire lives, but their home language was maybe something else than English, but they grew up speaking English in schools throughout their entire lives, so it might not be their primary language, but like I just don't want to overlap and, and have people who maybe the program isn't for. Julio, do you understand what I mean by that? I apologize, I had to step away for a moment to answer another call. I think you were talking about, you know, basically immigrant families here and whether at their language proficiency here. Um, yeah, so we could have someone who has English as their second language, but has gone through all of their schooling, um, and it was and was born in Vermont. But you know, the first language that they learned at home was the native tongue of their parents. So, you know, English would be their second language, but in in hindsight, you know. You know, English may be their most dominant language as well. Um, so, are you okay with just including immigrants so that we don't wrong, you know, fall into another category of um, trying to really figure out? Yes, I think that's what I was driving is. I think immigrant would cover that, although I would say immigrant families. So, you may have, you may be a Vermont born child of someone who's a new, is a new American. Uh, and growing up in, in a, a household where the primary language is in English. Um, I, I, and I, the, the sad truth is that uh, the, the very difficulty with speaking English or speaking with, even with, with a heavy uh, non-American accent, um, you know, creates problems for people even if they are uh, native Vermonters or, or born here in the U.S., they are often mistaken for people who uh, weren't born. You know, where are you from? Well, you know, I'm from Montpelier. That's where I was born. Nowhere are you really from. It's the sort of treatment that they can get um, starting off from primary education through through employment and, and public life. So that's really, I think, if you're talking about part of that immigrant family, that first generation. Uh, or, you know, household, um, that's what I would encompass because, uh, or, or that I would address here. That's, so I think immigrant, you know, immigrant household, you know, would encompass that. 
because they, they do. I mean, we see those we see those cases, and it's it's not just uh, people, unfortunately, are not as um, they are not as welcoming when they when they perceive someone as being different. Well, thank you for that, Julio. Unfortunately, I don't think it stems just from someone who has first generation. Um, you know, I'm fifth generation New Yorker, and uh, I still get to this day, no, where are you really from? No, I'm, I'm from New York. Oh, where, where is your family from? From New York. So, um, yeah. you know, yeah. I think, unfortunately, we it, it, can, it can last uh, quite a long time, especially if you may look colored, even though I come from such a diverse city myself. Um, so I, I definitely do understand that. Uh, Julio, what are your thoughts about choosing an immigrant or an immigrant household? Uh, but I think we may have to link to maybe first generation uh, because, you know, some immigrant households may have multiple generational. Um, I mean, I, I'm a I'm inclined to take the broader approach and have, you know, part of an immigrant household where you have, you know, your, your, you have a blood relative in the family who's living in your household, um, whether that's your uncle or your aunt or your grandparents living with your parents. Um, because I just think that Vermont historically is very protective or, and very, and takes a very, um, a hard stand in the law uh, on people who, who uh, uh, are, you know, are perceived as not being from Vermont. Um, so, I, uh, an, an immigrant household, I think, is you know, it's a, it's kind of a category that you sometimes see in the American um, uh, survey from the uh, from the Census Bureau, which is a recognition that you have those households. And so that's what I really meant, and, and I agree that it would be, and, and I think household is a way to, to deal with that, because um, you're right, people do have extended families, especially when they're trying to get on their feet and, um, and find a place in the community and the economy. And I would just add parenthetically about the, the comment about New York. Vermont is one of the few states, maybe it might even now be the second state, that prohibits discrimination on place of birth, so it's illegal in Vermont to discriminate in employment against somebody because they're viewed as a New Yorker or they're from the South. Uh, and, and that is a product of, uh, I think, a historical recognition that uh, what some of my Vermont-born relatives, I wasn't born in Vermont, but some of my Vermont-born born relatives would call flatlanders. I uh, have uh, people who are not viewed as part of the homespun culture of, of Vermont. And the uh, Vermont legislature, I think, a long time ago, very wisely recognized that people who are viewed as uh, new to the state might face hostilities or challenges as well. I think that's a little, as a practical matter, I think that's very hard to apply in practice in this context. Um, but, uh, but I just wanted to throw that out because it's a very fair point and it is um, something that we do we do encounter and uh, um, it, it's not just New York that is sometimes I with suspicion. Yeah, I mean, I was just showcasing New York because it is, you know, one of the most diverse cities in the world. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. and, and so, uh, unfortunately, you know, this is an, you know, occurrence just as human nature, almost. Um, but yes, I agree with you about immigrants. One of the things that we don't want to include everything that is necessarily protected, um, like, you know, oh, if you come from another state, but, you know, we want to try to make, uh, promote and encourage people to be included in this new industry. Julio, what are your thoughts about saying immigrants or immigrant household? Uh, I would go with an immigrant or a member or a member of an immigrant household. Thank you, Julio. Not are your thoughts? I, I think that sounds good. Um, you know, I'm wondering if though if that might create any confusion, uh, you know, somebody is a first generation American or first generation Vermonter and 
the description is immigrant households, might they think that it's only referring to their parents or relatives, or will should we add a note that includes that if you're a first generation American, um, you're covered in this? Um, how would you like to see it? Do you want it to say immigrant? Do you want it to say immigrant and first generation American or immigrant household? I think having in, or member of an immigrant household, including first generation born Americans, I, I think would provide a bit more clarity for some of uh, for a potential applicant that's looking at it. Okay. So I will have it as immigrant or current member of an immigrant household or a first generation American because I want us to be very careful of saying first generation household because that could include their children that may be now second generation. Yeah. Okay, great. Susanna, your thoughts? I am comfortable with um, just putting in a note that clarifies what we mean when we say household or first generation household. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this earlier, if it was already said, but are we, does the person have to be first generation just by lineage of one parent or both? Mm, good question. I, well, I might consider that to be both parents. Julio, you're shaking your head at no, I would definitely say one parent. The framework that I bring to all of this is to think about groups that historically encounter unfair challenges and, and discrimination in Vermont. Uh, and I think, and that, you know, people who, uh, you know, may have one parent's an immigrant, they come here, they meet someone, they fall in love, they raise a family here. Um, it, I mean, it is just the fact that their children can bear, um, you know, the brunt of discrimination just by their association with the one parent. Um, so I, I, I just, I, I wouldn't be, you know, that, um, you know, that, that, that stingy with the way that you're drawing the line because I think that, um, you know, experience shows that they can have a very, very different life here than, uh, than maybe their classmates or their peers in the workplace. And um, Vermont has, has recognized that and um, uh, in, in a variety of laws um, legislatively because there's been a history of, of problems. So I would, I would, would say one parent is fine. However, they wouldn't necessarily be considered first generation if their one of their parents was considered to be in America for several generations and may not face the same issues. But would they still be considered a member of an immigrant household if their mother or father was an immigrant? I think that's what we're trying to figure out right now. I'm going to let you guys think for a few minutes um, because we need to pause to have public comments and we will come back to this. Do you have comments? Mm -hmm. there's, no there's no public comment today, Gina. Okay, thank you. So, Susanna, your thoughts on what should should it be one family household, two fam uh, one member, or both? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Julio. I think that one is enough. And, um, and also in terms of whether you count as first generation if one of your parents is a previous generation of American, I think that makes you not first generation. However, the lineage that you have from one of your, your parents being an immigrant does create the potential for you to experience negative outcomes. So you may not qualify as first generation, but you would be part of an immigrant household. And um, gosh, I was going to say some. Oh, I was going to say, you know, I mean, the federal government, for example, during the CARES Act, stimulus payments excluded an entire household of people from payment if one person didn't have legal immigration status here. So you know, that's one of the ways where our very government was 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 creating harm for people, even if they were 
born here, um, just if they lived with someone who wasn't. So I, I would feel strongly that we would take the same tack and say, if you have one member of your household, that has historically been something that could jeopardize the whole household. So, um, you know, yeah. Can we say parental figure, maybe? Because if they have an aunt or uncle who lives in their household who's an immigrant, but both their parents are are second generation American, um, how, how do you feel about that, Julio? Uh, I, I feel a little bit like I'm getting tied up in knots or around the different ways that families can be put together. Um, yeah. I think that. Um, uh, again, I, 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 I had proposed immigrant households because I understand that people can be raised by uh, different family members or have a couple of generations in the household. Um, so I, you know, I'm not favoring the more inclusive result. And I think if there is, you know, a suspicion by the, the board that someone is trying to gain the system by uh, you know saying, well, I have a you know someone emigrated to Vermont from Cincinnati, uh, you know, and then that's not really the, the spirit or, or the the, the eligil- eligibility um, when you can't benefit at, at eligibility. That should be something that would be subject to review people are going, to, are going to have to make truthful representations and so i'm not i'm not to worry about people squeaking by or trying to take advantage of these benefits because it was really their older cousin who's only a few years older than them was really the person who was in the household while um, the parents were trying to make a life for the family temporarily you know looking for work um, away from their household. So um, yeah, I'm just I'm more comfortable. That's why I'm comfortable with the immigrant household where you're talking about the family. You know, that, that's the unit I would be using. Um, so. uh, how about immigrant or current member of an immigrant family? And we already have a definition of a family member. So that would be yes, an that would parent be. parent or upbringing or et cetera. Instead of saying household, because then that would mean obviously clarity of that. And then a first generation American would then, or considers, or some side of them is first generation, um, would then include if their parent was an immigrant, et cetera. So I think- I, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair approach. Or if, the, if someone was a stepchild or grew up with someone who was, who was an immigrant as well. So we already have that definition of family. Nada, how are you with going with um, immigrant or current member of an Im- immigrant family? Or member of an immigrant family, which we already have that definition of an immigrant, which is wide and I think that's fine. I'm fine with that. Okay. So let us vote on this. Uh, so what groups should be included? Women, people with disabilities, LGBT community, uh, immigrant or current member of an immigrant family, a refugee, or um, someone who's faced discrimination based on race, color, or religion. I'm going to leave um, color or race in there just in case it is not covered for some reason because, you know, they, they face some sort of discrimination that does not was not incorporated by social equity program. Nader, how do you vote? I I vote yes. Thank you. And Julio? Yes. Thank you. So for the record, there are two guesses for the groups that should be included, and we will be using the definition of our current family that we have on record. Uh, for the member of the family for immigrants. So, the last thing that we have to go through are what some of the benefits that um, these groups should receive. Now, this is just to encourage them um, to be 
in the cannabis industry. Now, we are not focusing, we're not saying that any harm was done to, uh, due to the prohibition of cannabis. Some of the benefits that we have down and we have spoken about are educational programs, so like certificate programs if they're created, workshops that are created, you know, so our online or in-person educational programs, uh, priority processing, and then a suggestion about an application fee waiver uh, to try to um, include and suggest to them that they may want to be more encouraged um, to come into the industry. And I'm just going to leave it right there and pause because we only have one minute left of this call. So just things for you to consider. Um, you know, what benefits do you like on here? What you may dislike? What would you like to add? And that is where we will start off with on Thursday. Is there anything else that you may want to discuss for a diversity, equity, and inclusion program that other than benefits? Nader, is there anything that you'd like to for this committee to discuss? Uh, nothing's uh, jumping to mind right now. But, um, if anything comes to mind until our next meeting, I'll bring it up at the next meeting. But yeah, nothing at the moment. Thank you. And Julio? Uh, I'm the same. Nothing comes to mind right now. Thank you. Susanna? Same. Thank you. Lindsay? Same. Thank you. Thanks. And Julie, anything that comes to mind? No, but thank you for asking. Thanks. And Jeffrey, we will discuss this after this call, so I'm, I'm sure you might have some thoughts on your mind. So with that, we can um, close out this session. I do I have a motion to, to close out this meeting? I'll make that motion. Second. Thank you so much. That was so quick this time, Julio. Just ready to go. Thank you, Dyer. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the recommendations that have been made today. I think it was very successful. Um, so, so far, it looks like Thursday may be our last call. Um, I'm not entirely sure, uh, but it seems that way. So, maybe. And I will be sending you out the reports of recommendations that were made up until this point so that we can discuss a little bit about all of the recommendations and make sure that we're still in alignment for everything. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you.